do 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 guess what time it is it's grill the priest time still encouraging you to send in some uh suggestions for a new theme song so you don't have to hear me do this one thanks for those who have sent in uh the couple of uh, suggestions so far and appreciate it keep sending those questions in as well ask father at hfcmn.org ask father at hfcmn.org and we'll keep doing the questions so we're going to dive right on in the first question can catholics receive holy communion more than once a day and if so under what circumstance well the first thing we want to know is that the normal reception of holy communion is within the integrity of the prayer of the Mass. That's where the reception of Holy Communion is most natural. But there are extraordinary circumstances. Boy, oh boy, don't we know that from the past three months, where we've not been able to go to Mass, and yet we were able to make appointments to receive Holy Communion. So there are times when we receive Holy Communion apart from Mass. And one of those most special times to receive Communion apart from Mass is, of course, when we're sick when Holy Mother Church brings us the grace of the Holy Eucharist to help us in our suffering. So I want you to, to know that this connection between the Mass and the Eucharist is always vital. Even when we receive Holy Communion apart from Mass, it still is the fruit of the prayer of the Mass. It is the fruit of Jesus' self-offering to the Father and how all of us are gathered up in that great prayer of praise and worship and receive His body and blood given to us out of love. So, to answer the exact question, can you receive communion more than once? Yes. Under what circumstance? Here you go. You may receive Holy Communion up to twice a day, but the second time must be within the full context of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. All right? So the second time must be within the full context of the Mass. Let me give you an example. You've gone to the hospital to visit a friend. And I come in to bring your friend Holy Communion. And you're Catholic, and so I ask you, would you also like to receive Holy Communion? You say yes. So I give your friend who's in the hospital and you who are visiting, you both receive Holy Communion. Now, later that same day, you go to daily Mass. Or maybe you've got a wedding or a funeral that you're going to attend. And there at that Mass, you may receive Holy Communion a second time. Now, let's reverse the order. You go to Mass first thing in the morning. You receive Holy Communion at Mass. Then you go to visit your friend at the hospital. And I come in. I can give your friend Holy Communion, but not you. Now, does that seem strange? It seems like, well, it's just an oddity of timing. Yes and no. The real reason why the church insists that the second time be within the full context of a Mass is there were some people who had a, a great desire for Jesus' love and the grace of the Eucharist, but some funny ideas. And so they would run around from one church to another trying to collect Holy Communions. You know, and the churches want to discourage that. Uh, so, so that's why there's this, this rule, and that's the way it's written. So I hope that answered your question. We're just glad to be able to receive communion even once a day uh, right now, or even once a week, uh, not being able to fit everybody in church on a Sunday. But we're getting there to keep that desire alive. The next question is about heaven. Heaven is supposed to be a place of perfect joy. Indeed. Do you think that the Virgin Mary has perfect joy? Her statues sometimes shed tears. Wow, that's a deep question. Does Mary have perfect joy? Absolutely, without a question. Because heaven is that place of perfect joy. Why is it a place of perfect joy? Because the human heart was created for God. And in heaven, we are in the presence of God. Every good thing you and I have ever experienced here on earth is simply a sign of how much God loves us. In heaven, we have the reality of God's love. 
So in heaven, we are satisfied beyond any measure of longing by just God's love. Sometimes people make a mistake and they think about heaven as my favorite fishing hole or my favorite golf course or this, that, and the other. No, that's what I call a God plus spirituality. Somehow I'm only going to be happy if I have God plus this other thing, plus this other thing, plus this other thing. No, we were created with an infinite longing for the love of God and we are perfectly happy, perfectly happy just with that love and nothing else. However, there is what we could call an accidental happiness uh, uh, when, when we have other things that are present, like if my loved ones are also in heaven, that would be an accidental happiness that I would enjoy. And the reason the Blessed Virgin Mary's statues sometimes weep is indeed that her children, us, don't always live according to the law of God and aren't on the path to heaven. And Mary weeps at seeing us not headed to our perfect joy, but headed in the wrong direction. In fact, Our Lady appeared very famously at a place called La Salette in France, and there she was, the weeping Madonna, uh, because of the sins of the world. Interesting, the sins that she was particularly weeping over right then, not keeping the Lord's day holy and using the Lord's name in vain. Those were the two sins that most caused her to weep at that one. So let's remember that the way we keep our Sundays. We don't want the Blessed Mother to weep. And let's be sure that with our words, we don't uh, take the Lord's name in vain. Right? So again, heaven, we will be perfectly happy. But there is an extra joy that comes with certain other things, such as the presence of our loved ones. All right, now a question about the Mass. It seems the Mass has developed into the pinnacle of our Catholic worship. Yet a lot of the recent readings from the Acts of the Apostles tell of the Apostles and disciples going to various distant places like Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, to mention a few, and simply preaching to the people, telling them about Jesus, His teachings, and His miracles. So then why did the Mass come into being, and when? Has it always been the same format, or has it evolved as to content? For example, was there always the reading of a psalm, the singing of the Kyrie, Sanctus or Agnus Dei, prayer of the offerings, etc.? Could you please give us a brief history of the Mass? Oh, 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 oh. my dear friend, you know I can't give a brief anything. Uh, I go on and on and on. And you get me talking about the Mass? Oof, you're on one of my favorite topics. In fact, if you go to our website, you will find that I gave an entire Lenten lecture series on the Mass. Not the history of the Mass, although some history is in there, but I think it's over six hours. So, you want to do research on the Mass? I'll send you there. Go to hfcmn.org and look for my lectures on the Mass there. Uh, we also have it on our SoundCloud account. Uh, I'm told that we have one of those now. Anyway, so you can find lots of stuff that I've said about the Mass. But just to briefly, <laughs> briefly try, or try to be brief, the Mass was always part. From, from Holy Thursday, the Last Supper, all the way through, the Mass has always been part of the Christian life. So when we speak about the Apostles preaching, they didn't tell you everything. But you can assume that on the Lord's Day every week, the Mass was celebrated. Because we do have accounts from some of those early martyrdoms where, for example, the martyrs uh, of Abitin, they were uh, hauled before the Roman magistrate for having gathered to celebrate the Mass. And when they said, Don't, did you know that this was illegal and, and it has a penalty of death? They said, without Sunday, we cannot live. And by that, what they meant is without that celebration of the Eucharist. That's what they were talking about. Now, has the form of the Mass evolved? Absolutely. You mentioned the Kyrie. I'm glad you did. Sometimes someone will say, oh, you know, the Kyrie, why do we have all that Latin? Ha! The Kyrie is Greek, not Latin. It's the last remnant of the fact that in the early days, the Eucharist was celebrated in Greek. In fact, the word Eucharist is Greek. Echaristo is how you say thank you in Greek. 
So thanksgiving is what Eucharist means. So the Mass was celebrated in Greek very early on, and then as it spread through the Roman Empire, Latin, and then eventually other languages. It was Saints Cyril and Methodius, around the year 800, translated the Mass into the Slavic languages uh, of the Eastern European peoples. It's called today Old Church Slavonic. And that's where our Orthodox brothers and sisters get their liturgy. Uh, so, so yes, the Mass has evolved and changed. There were always scripture readings. In fact, if you look at the second Eucharistic prayer, that's the one all of you like because it's the shortest. It actually is the most ancient Eucharistic prayer, but it's a fragment. It would have been much, much longer. And we, we hear from the accounts that we got that Eucharistic prayer from, that there were, it was preceded by all sorts of scripture readings and preaching and all of that. So yes, the Mass has evolved, but the essence of it, the invocation of the Holy Spirit, uh, the words of Christ from the Last Supper, the transformation of, of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, that's always been there from the very beginning. So don't be disturbed if you don't see it mentioned explicitly in the Acts of the Apostles. You can absolutely be sure that that was going on every single Sunday. All right, great question. I'm sorry, it wasn't a brief answer. All right, now here's another one. In a Sunday homily a few weeks ago, Ha-ha! Someone was paying attention. You said the door to heaven was blocked before Jesus died for us. My question is, where did the souls of the people who lived and died before Jesus go when they died? I'm assuming they didn't go to hell, so where did they go? All right. Yes, the, the, the way to heaven was blocked uh, before Jesus. So what the church's tradition speaks of is a place called limbo. Now you're going, oh, I've heard of limbo. Okay, be careful. The church has a theological tradition that speaks about two limbos. The limbo of the infants, that is, where there was speculation that, that children who died before baptism went. Because baptism was so essential to salvation, they said, well, they can't go to heaven, so they, but they're innocent except of original sin, so we just kind of we'll put them in this limbo place, kind of uh, neither here nor neither there. But there's another place called limbo of the fathers, meaning those uh, old timers before the time of Christ. The fathers being the patriarchs of the Old Testament. And so there was this tradition that they went to this waiting room until Christ opened the gates of heaven. And in fact, when we profess in the creed, that Jesus descended into hell, what we are talking about is that he went to this antechamber of hell, the limbo of the fathers, and rescued there Adam and Eve and all these other righteous people that died before Jesus came and then brought them with him in his resurrection to heaven. That's the theological tradition of the church. So it's a, it's a, it's a mystery, but I think that's what the, the best minds over the centuries through prayer and study have come up with. I hope that satisfies you. Thanks for grilling me yet again. Send your questions to askfather at hfcmn.org and keep your suggestions for a new theme song coming too. All right. Have a great day. God bless.